it's Jenny. Welcome back once again to Solid Gold. This week I have a super exciting video for you guys. I'm here at Dandy Aranda's in Michigan and you can see all these gorgeous, gorgeous fish behind me. I'm just like in goldfish heaven right now. It's amazing. And I want to introduce you guys to <laughs> Ken Fisher. <laughs> Ken is the single owner and operator of Dandy Aranda's. You do all this all by yourself. Yeah, that right? I have to say I do. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, I wish you guys, I'll show you some more clips of all the different tanks and fish that are here, but there are so many fish, I don't know, I just don't know how you do it. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> it gets done one way or another, though. I, sure. I try my best. Yeah. Sometimes it's uh, it's not quite 24-7, but it's, um, it's a whole lot every day. So how long have you been in the goldfish hobby? I started at about three years old. Oh wow. My dad was into tropicals, mollies, swordtails, and then we went to a pet store one time and I saw my first little black moor, cute little oh. telescope eyes, and it just seemed to be so much more character than the tropicals. Yeah. And really seemed to respond to uh, approaching the tank, whereas the tropicals just kind of dart back and forth. And um, got into it then, and um, never stopped. I guess I got into it more heavily when I was in college, and bought my first breeding pair of black ranchu back in the 90s, which was kind of a scary thing. I'd never had fish shipped to me before. I had no idea how it would happen. Yeah. Um, went to the UPS store to pick them up. UPS person carried the box out sideways, and I was all stressed out and freaked <laughs> out. And uh, but everything was fine with the fish. Never did produce a very good black ranchu, but I had a lot of fun with it. Then the next thing you know, I bought my first home and had like six tanks in the basement, then twelve tanks, then kitty swimming pools in the basement, and. Um, the next thing you know, it turned into a small business, and now here I am. Did you ever think that you would be like the crazy fish dude with like your basement just full of water? <laughs> no, I still, it's a weird question. People say, how do you get into this? And yeah. it's like, looking back, I, I don't really know how it happened. It just, just kind of happens. Yeah. So, what is your background in? Do you have any professional training in another craft? Actually, I've got quite a diverse kind of a skill set. I started at Ohio State University pre-med. Oh wow! Realized that wasn't for me. Yeah, it's quite um, different. Changed my degree many times. Ultimately, graduated in a degree in communications with a minor in economics. But changing degrees several times. I studied a lot of biology, plant biology, some marine biology, and um, then as I got into the fish hobby, I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could to try and succeed because it's not easy. Before I went full-time with Dandy Aranda's, I actually had a an audio-visual company. Used to do sound and video for private events, corporate events, and did a fair amount of video production, which when I first took over Dandy Aranda's, the company had been a only video-based company that offered uh, actually, back in the day, it was VHS tapes mm -hmm. of, of the imported collections of fish, each each importation, uh, each tank of fish was videotaped for a few minutes, and then those VHS tapes went out to, it was about a hundred private collectors around the country. I would mail them the tapes, and they would pick the fish off the VHS tape before, or that I would send out, and um, then I would send it to them. That was all before internet. So can you guys imagine, instead of being able to go to the website and see exact photos of, you know, the like several different photos of the fish you want and just be able to one click and buy it, instead you have to order the video, watch the video, write down which ones you want, call Ken, try to describe it to yeah, you. Yeah, you have to explain and, it, you right. say like, I'm at this point on the tape, which most people didn't understand what was called time code, which <laughs> Some VHS machines would help you understand. You could say I'm at like one hour, ten minutes, ten seconds, and I want that fish in the top corner. Yeah. Um, but that was difficult with VHS because you didn't have the navigation that you do with DVD. And now you must be so happy with how the website is now. It must make it so much easier, and yeah. for the customers as well. Well, truthfully, the, for the longest time, that VHS, DVD format, the company was a side business. It wasn't profitable. Mm -hmm. because on the, the VHS or the DVD, everyone wanted the one fish. 
the, the one cherry out of the tank. And then for the next two weeks, everyone would call me saying, I want that fish. And I would have to then say, I'm sorry, it's sold. And so that I would have 80% of the fish left. But now with the auction, I can put each fish on there. Usually they sell, and if not, I will relist them in a couple weeks. And when it's sold, the other customers know right away instead of having to call you and ask. Yes. And actually, it took me a long time to get the website developed because being a small business, I tried to wear all of the hats, tried to do everything myself. I didn't know better, but the one hat that I really wasn't prepared to wear was web development. It just didn't, didn't look right on you, I guess. No, I wasn't going to try and become a web expert on top of fish pathology, customer service, all of the work that goes into it. And then fortunately, um, it was actually a good customer, a new customer here fairly locally that bought some fish from me. And he happened to be a web designer and he's, a, he's an awesome guy. Um, and without him, I wouldn't be where I am right now. But. Um, one step at a time, it's really come together. So everybody knows that my favorite is the butterfly telescope, and I have my reasons for that, but do you have a favorite goldfish? And if so, what is it? And what do you like the most about it? Well, I'll tell you if you tell me. If yeah, I tell you why I like butterflies? Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> it's hard, because there's so many things I love about them. I just find them to be super beautiful. I think that the big tail really balances out the big eyes really well yeah, and kind of a gives a sense of proportion to the fish mm -hmm. and I like how the the gracefulness of well a, a well a good swimmer can be a graceful one but otherwise they can look kind of silly but yeah. I think the the fins the way that they kind of float through the water it's just really pretty yes. I just I've always been attracted to them and since the, the first purchase I ever made from Dandy Randis was a couple of butterflies yep, I and think I think I remember yep and that's I just can't get away from them. Nothing else captures my attention the same way. I actually like a lot of varieties, but mm -hmm. my newest favorite are the ingot types, okay. which are the short tail arandas. Years ago, when I first started seeing them, some of the suppliers were calling them Ryukin aranda short tail hybrids. Oh, that's such a long but, name. <laughs> yeah, but now they've come up with a lot of the names I think are derived from maybe what they kind of think they look like, mm -hmm. and they come up with that monetary uh, ingot, the gold ingot. The which coin, is, yeah. yeah. And uh, so they kind of come up with these nicknames and then they start sticking and here now, some years later, that's what they generally call them. Some look more like uh, a lion head with the dorsal. Mm -hmm. Other ones are more like that deeper body short tail. Um, but I like those because they've been really robust. You know, the goldfish, because of what we've done to them with the, with the breeding and the mutation. We have kind of compromised them as far as their hardiness. And yeah. you made a point about the proportions on the butterfly. Um, you know, that's really important. And those are hard things to get, uh, get right on a lot of these fish, getting the proportions right. And the ingots seem like um, they could more consistently, you know, good overall. And they've got the things that I always like. My, my old favorite was Ranchu, which I still love. I still love Arandas. I love the butterflies. I love a broad tail Ryukin, long tail Ryukin. I mean, I, I really kind of love them all. I um, I used to actually not really be a fan of some of the fish like bubble eyes. Mm -hmm. I think I told you earlier when I used to see them in the pet store that they weren't very good quality and that they were almost pathetic. They were yeah. just sit on the bottom and kind of waddle. And yeah. I used to say they look like a mouse with their legs cut off and they just, <laughs> you know, it's, they were pathetic. But really good bubble eyes now, I, I realize, can be good fish. We were looking at some really old Dandy Aranda's videos and the bubble eyes were swimming around like crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah, they can be athletic. Yeah, and they got off the bottom and some of them had really long, pretty tails. And of course, when you try and breed fish to remove the dorsal fin, it's hard to get the backs right, whether that's ranchu or if you pronounce it ranchu. Um, and the bubble eyes, um, of course then they have, some suppliers have what they call, they like to give a, a better um, marketing, I think, name to some of these fish. They have what they call flag fin bubble eyes, yeah. which I think are just some of the ones that ended up having dorsal fins. Yeah. But they're nice fish and they go ahead and raise them up and um, those can be really nice too. And some of these fish, I don't see that often anymore. The, the hobby's changed over the last five, six years, or I guess every year and some of these varieties are becoming harder and harder to find, like the celestials we saw on the video. I think that's where small-time hobbyist breeders can really be a benefit to the hobby because a lot of them, like I guess I consider myself one of them, I, I don't breed fish 
super commercially or anything. I sell them when I have them available, but uh, I just have a passion for butterfly telescopes, so I breed them and I try to improve the breed. And there's other hobbyists out there doing the same thing with Bristol's, Ronchu, Aranda, Blackmore's, yeah. Celestials even. It's not as common, but they're there. Yeah, and I think that's what's really kept the, the hobby, well, actually got it to be where it is at this point, is all these little small independent farmers and hobbyists that bred because they enjoyed it, but unfortunately things are changing in this world and uh, a lot of the Chinese breeders, the next generation, the younger people aren't interested in carrying that on and so it's become more commercial and some people call it the big three. They're steering towards Ranchu, Ryuka, and Arandas. And it's just great news for yeah. you if you like them. Yeah. <laughs> We well, were talking about the breeding. Your uh, butterfly looked great. They look oh, better than you. some of the ones I've been able to import. I love doing it, and yeah. I have a passion for it. I want them to look perfect, you know? Yeah. And there's never a perfect with goldfish. Even some of the best fish you have here, if you look close enough, you'll find something wrong with any goldfish. So the perfectionist in me has to kind of chill out a little bit. I've had people say, I want the perfect show fish, and some people say they're willing to spend any amount of money for the perfect fish. and I, you know, I could be more shrewd and say, yeah, this fish is perfect, but I'm the first one to acknowledge that um, you scrutinize a fish long enough, you can usually find, you know, what would be considered a flaw. Yeah, technically speaking, yeah. or and not even necessarily a flaw, but everyone has their own personal taste as well. Yeah. Maybe it's a perfect fish confirmation-wise, but, oh, I prefer more red on a fish, you know? And then to that person, it wouldn't be perfect anymore. Yeah, and there's but. different definitions of confirmation or True. different, it's all subjective. I've always liked, you know, some people want the most compact, fattest headed uh, ranch you. I kind of sometimes prefer a little longer bodied one because they generally, they're not as removed from their natural form. They swim better, they're usually longer lived and sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. I find that uh, I have some tubs outside that just have a sponge filter yep. and then my indoor tank has this high-tech sump with a UV sterilizer and separate returns for the water outflow. My fish do better in the simple tub with a sponge filter than they do in that tank. Yes. So less is definitely more when it comes to goldfish. Well, and I've simplified things a lot and it, I used to have power filters, big canister filters, thousands of dollars worth of them running on every system and if the power would fail, some of them would not restart back up, the impeller would get stuck, and um, it became a lot of work and a lot of maintenance cleaning them. I've retrofitted my holes, just virtually everything except for a few of my systems are now all air driven through giant sponge filters. And um, if there's one point of failure, it's the blower that feeds all of, all of the systems and I've got a backup. We're all familiar with the front end of Dandy Arandas, the website, the bidding, the auction and all that, hmm. but what is a typical week or even a day like for you working with these fish hands-on? All of my fish systems are in my basement. I've got a huge walkout basement. Um, I would love to have a purpose-built facility that I could have everything in, natural daylight, but unfortunately not having thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I've had to kind of DIY everything and it, I guess you could use the word hodgepodge. I've acquired uh, a lot of 75 gallon tanks. Um, I bought out a whole pet land to, to uh, acquired some of these systems. And they look really nice too. Yeah, awesome. and they're, um, they're pretty functional but I don't really like having to get on a ladder to deal with some of the stuff. I mean, it's nice to just be able to reach in and, and do stuff because ultimately there's always maintenance and you always have to do something with the fish. So that adds a variable that I don't like, but with a certain limitation on the footprint of the, of the space I've got, things have to go vertical. So I've got stuff stacked and I've got tubs here and there and everywhere, um, tens of thousands of gallons. My morning, I guess, if you really want to know, I start out, check my emails. Mm -hmm which there's dozens. Finally make my way downstairs and start doing it. And um, water quality is the key. A lot of people are surprised. I've got about 100 tanks um, and tubs, uh, indoor swimming pool with fish in it, um, it's box, really cool. box ponds in one part of the basement. Um, but people come here and they're surprised that it doesn't smell fishy. Yeah. They're like, I 
can't believe it doesn't you know, smell like a pet store in here, but that's because, you know, poor water quality is, is, is what causes a stinky situation and I can't afford to have poor, poor water quality. Right. It These has are to be you know, perfect. Fish. You were here for the last two days and you can see there's hardly any sick fish here. There's a right. few that are problematic. Um, there's really no pathogens. The ones that are problematic are maybe have a little bit of a balance or buoyancy mm -hmm. issue or, or whatever. There's and you do a good job keeping up with that. You know, any time that I've noticed, oh, Ken, you know, that one looks a little, you know, whatever, I may have noticed and you said, yep, that one, such and such and such, and this is what I'm doing with it. I've been keeping an eye on it, I've, or I'm treating it. Yeah. So you, you seem to know all these fish, um, especially at least the ones that need the extra attention. Yeah, and it's always changing, too, because things are fine one day, and the next thing you, you come down and there's spawning damage. The female can be beaten up, fins are torn up, and they need to get a little more care, and there's some little kind of tonics and things that I'll do to treat those. Um, fish will get scales knocked off, and uh, so yeah, every time you think everything's perfect, then you realize it's not. When I have new fish coming in, um, the first week or two, I'm changing eight to 10,000 gallons of water every day, because a lot of these systems are you know, pretty heavily stocked more heavily stocked than I would recommend as a hobbyist to keep them, but I'm changing sometimes 80% of the water every other day or twice a week. And then that, of course, turns into a whole lot of feeding through feeding the fish. And yeah. feeding soil and grain is um, a lot more work because you have to make it and you have to chop it up, but I really believe that that's the best food that I've come across so far. It has a huge nutritional spectrum, the, the list of ingredients is, is awesome, uh, and then the, the moisture content in the food is really important. That's um, For digestibility, right? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the goldfish food that's sold, if, it, if you're going to put it on the shelf, it has to have a shelf life, uh, it can't have moisture in it or it's going to go rancid. So everything's dry as a bone, and the fish just aren't used to eating something It's not like natural. That. Yeah. Your question started with the, the day, it's, yeah, it's constant maintenance, feeding the fish, changing water, but then there's the whole business side of it, customer service, answering the emails, supporting customers that may have a problem. Um, then there's the shipping the fish. Uh, each day before I ship, I understand the fish that are going out the next day, so I will segregate them and fast them, mm -hmm. so basically they're not pooping in the bag, producing as much waste so yeah. that the water's, you know, better. Um, upon arrival and um, giving them kind of a final checkup to make sure they're good to go. They've all been quarantined. I quarantine all the fish for four weeks. Um, a lot of people think that you can import fish and turn around and just sell them. And fish, they'll come in. My suppliers, I trust that the fish are healthy and they generally are. Um, but every shipment I've ever had, and some people wouldn't acknowledge this, but every shipment that I've ever had there's always hitchhikers, there's always some number of parasites. They come from ponds, and in a pond environment out in the sunshine, they can thrive with, and they can deal with a certain level of parasites, just like a human right. could deal with a certain bacterial load. And, yep, and they have maybe, their own antibodies and their own uh, immune system to fight those things off if it's minor enough. Yeah, but if you're stuck on a confined, confined area like a cruise ship, and you know, really hit with a high load, uh, bacterial load or whatever, then you're going to end up getting sick. Yep. Um, so that's the problem when you bring all these fish in. You put them in a tank. Um, the population of the uh, of the parasites, you know, kind of explodes. And, and I think that's really the reason a lot of people end up failing in the hobby. They get fish from pet stores or whatever that, that are not quarantined. And I, I can say for a fact that not all, but virtually all, most pet stores and, and other suppliers are not quarantining their fish. And they're healthy at first. Um, they can deal with those few parasites. In fact, when I get fish from China, I can scrape them. I don't, actually, I don't even scrape them the first few days because it, you're not going to realize anything. Extra handling. Yeah. Gonna... Well, also, if you scrape them within the first couple of days, you may not find anything. But that doesn't mean there's no parasites. That just means there's not enough to realize it on the scrape. I think a lot of people get fish, and it's sad because they want to turn their child onto it. They get these fish for their family. They want to introduce their kid into taking care of a pet. And everything's fine for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's a problem and then they, they blame themselves. But yeah. I think it's because they got off to a bad start to begin with. Yeah. So I quarantine the fish for four weeks and there's 
with some prophylactic treatments that are done to clean them up. They get multiple scrapes throughout that time. Uh, there's dips involved, there's salt treatments, and then I start auctioning them uh, four weeks later. It's easy to, to say that you do all those things, and you know, we all read it on your website that you do scrapes and you quarantine and everything, but you guys, I'm here right now and I, I saw your microscope. We went out together, we even did some scrapes. You're a pro at it, you clearly do it multiple times a day, and it, it's true what he says on his website that you really do as much as you can. You don't want to sell sick fish to people, you know, well, you don't want that stress, you don't want that reputation. You send out some of the healthiest fish that I know of personally. It does me no good to send somebody a fish that's got a problem because then I've got to make it right. I've got to support more work for you. Yeah, it's difficult, but I, I really do care about, you know, trying to make it right and, and doing right by people. and. I think as a business that's the way you have to do it, otherwise um, you're going to have a reputation otherwise and that's going to catch up with you. So, Especially yeah. in this world we live in today with goldfish forums, I think if you look at the forums, 99.9% .9 of comments are positive about me. In this hobby, even in the best case scenario, some people are going to have problems. Mm -hmm. I've had problems. Even with healthy fish, in perfect scenarios, the fish are screwed up. Just like some of the dog breeds are bred for... Uh, the various mutations or um, however you define it. Uh, more and more extreme bodies. Yeah. So at a certain point we've kind of pushed the limit on that stuff and we've weakened the animal and um, like I say even in the best case scenario people are going to have problems and um, but I, I hope that people are never going to really have frustrations with me as far as my customer service even though I'm in a tough hobby. That's what I like about goldfish though. It's kind of like a combination of two of my biggest passions. The one being like biology and animals and the natural world and then art because goldfish to me really are like living works of art. Yeah, that's actually why I got into it. I'm really big into art. Actually an old Chinese man told me that the goldfish are like a little flower. But he also said they're like a little flower because they bloom and then they fade away. And some of these fish, we were talking about less is more. Um, when I went to China back in 2004, um, the one dealer that I went to, they actually almost they gave me like a test. I think they were trying to test my knowledge, like whether they were going to respect me um, <laughs> and my knowledge of it. And they had this, like, um, it was almost like a, a poster of sorts, and they had these pictures of these, these little, one of them were little pearl scales, crown pearl scales. And they were each different. They said, which one do you think is the best fish? And some of them had heads that were as big as the bodies. Oh, wow. And you know, a lot of people would say, oh, that's the best fish. They More said, They said, no, that's not the best fish, especially the young fish. That's too much too yeah. soon. It takes a while. And a lot of people, they want, people ask me all the time, I want a two and a half inch ranchie with a big head. That's just not, it, it t that's the thing that comes with, with uh, in second and third years. You really want to develop the fish more slowly and groom it slowly. If you put on too much of that too soon, it's not going to be long lived. So what is the process of importing a new batch of goldfish like? Do you just get a few at a time? Do you try to stock up and get a whole bunch, make it worth it? How do you go about even finding out where to get these fish from? What is it like? What's the experience like? It's very stressful. I've learned what sleep deprivation is like. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I'm not close to a port of entry. Um, there are designated ports of entry in the country for fish and wildlife. Okay. Um, there, I think there's 12. They're That's mostly, it? Wow. Yeah, it's like uh, major uh, ports of entry are like uh, LA, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Chicago is the one I go to. And, and how uh, far is that from here? Uh, it's pushing 300 miles. And so I've got five plus hour drive there. I've got a broker that helps, helps me make all this happen because there's a lot of paperwork and permits and things that need to be in place. Um, it used to be Fish and Wildlife was involved uh, and Customs, of course. Now USDA is involved. Um, so there's a lot of paperwork. There's health certificates that have to come from China. Um, all these permits need to be in place. Because of, of the travel and the fees that are involved, um, I get as many fish as I can at a time. I'm not like, um, most pet stores are getting their fish from what are called transshippers. Mm -hmm. Transshippers bring in hundreds of boxes of fish into major ports like, I think the, the biggest ones are on the east coast like Philly and then LA. 
those companies, they, they simply reoxygenate the bags and then forward them on to pet stores. Pet stores open up the fish, put them in their tanks, and then they, a lot of times they sell them the same day. Yep. Um, importing your own fish is not easy, and that's why I think if you look around, there's not many people doing what I do. It takes a unique kind of a, a set of variables that have to come into place. I mean, first is the understanding of the pathology to even be in the business. Uh, you know, a little bit of common sense and uh, ability to have customer service and be able to deal with the customers. Um, but then all this import stuff, having the connections in, in China to be able to get the fish, having trustworthy connections, getting what you pay for, um, getting healthy fish to begin with. It's only become harder, really, as time's gone on. The, the supply of the fish has become more difficult to get. Uh, the limitations as far as the importation. Um, and government agencies involved it become more difficult. I only do three or four shipments a year. Um, wow. And when I do, I stock up. I get as many fishes that I can, that I can handle. Um, a lot of it because the, the travel to Chicago, the costs involved. Um, when I go to Chicago and back, I, I leave at about 10 in the morning. The fish actually arrive uh, typically about noon because of the apathetic airline people, the other agencies involved. I don't, I'm not able to take possession of the fish until like 5 p.m. So then I get dumped into Chicago traffic, so it's rush hour traffic. I don't get home till about 1 in the morning, and then I'm up all night. So wow. when I do a shipment, I'm up about 30 hours straight. And um, At that point, it's almost like not even exciting to open the boxes anymore. Well, yeah, <laughs> it used to be fun and exciting. Now it's just like, oh man. <laughs> It takes a lot to be able to import these fish, and not not just anybody could do it. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I got into this business. I, I wanted to learn everything that I could, and I don't know if some people uh, know, but Dandy Arandis was actually started by a lady down in Alabama mm -hmm. in the late '80s, and she's the one that developed the VHS format. Uh, her name's Joanne Burke, and she was my mentor. I I had decades of experience with goldfish before I got into the business, but when I took it over, I still realized I needed to learn more, or as much as I could, and even at this point, I realized there's still more to learn. I'll never know it all. Every when time, you feel like you know it all, that's yeah. when you're in trouble. Yeah, and every time you think everything's perfect, then you have a new learning lesson, and it's always yeah. you learn the hard way. It was back in 2003, uh, my, my video production company was doing pretty well. And um, I had received a few of Joanne's VHS tapes, but I could never afford the fish. I was a young guy, out of college. I couldn't afford a $100 fish or $200 fish. And I was making just a little bit of money. I thought, I'm going to treat myself to a couple nice fish. Mm -hmm. And I called up Joanne, and she said, um, I can send you the tape, but there's very few fish left, and I'm actually getting out of the business. It became too labor-intensive for her. She just couldn't do it anymore. So Dandy Randas was just going to go away? Well, she told me at the time, she said, um, I want to sell the business, but I haven't found anybody that I want to sell it to. I, okay. I want to turn it over to somebody that, that um, you know, I, that can make it successful and, and continue it. I don't want to just... It's her see, legacy, you know? Yeah, I want, I want to see it succeed, so I need somebody that, you know, has some common sense and and uh, knows the fish and this and that. And I, she, of course, I was in Ohio and she was in Alabama, and I thought, the only way to really do this right is I, I'm going to come down and visit with you and we're going to talk about it. And I went down and spent the day with her, saw all these fish, and I was hooked. And. Um, she had things on an even kind of smaller scale, but she had all. I acquired all of her tanks and all of, all of the can. That's I learned from her, and I did it. I, you know, I was a Midwest guy. I didn't really know the best way to do this. I mean, going back, it'd have been again nice to have a purpose-built facility to, to you know, really do all this. But that's, that's a huge investment, and I didn't have that. So I did have enough money. Actually, thanks to my parents, my good old parents have helped me in so many ways. I should acknowledge that not only helping me with the initial investment, the money to, to, to buy the business from her. That was that was my first experience with sleep deprivation, was moving the business. Oh, because yeah. there were fish involved, and there were all the systems involved, so we had to get the fish out of the system, staged in one big tub, get all the tanks loaded up into a rental truck, and then get the fish in. I was up for 40 hours straight that time. 
And uh, that's a that's a weird thing. I never knew what that was like. You get some like weird sensory things where like your ears itch and it's it's not good staying up 40 hours no, straight. Don't, Too much don't caffeine. Don't do that again. Yeah, I think sometimes unless you push yourself and you go through things that are difficult, you don't necessarily appreciate the things that are good. And then when I, um, you know, I've got problems with the fish. I sometimes I lose fish that I I think things are fine and that they're not. But then I have customers that send me this huge, this huge appreciation and emails saying, you know, I love my new fish and thank you for what you do. And that really kind of helps make it all worth it. It's, in fact, it seems like every time I get kind of down thinking, oh, geez, I need to go work at McDonald's or something because <laughs> this is not that lucrative. It's a whole lot of work. Even McDonald's would be better than this. <laughs> then somebody will send me a wonderful email and be so thankful, and it really makes me feel good. It's kind of like a, Everybody likes to be a shot in the arm, like, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Obviously, running an operation like this takes a lot of dedication and perseverance. What is it that keeps you motivated? Is it that, or is there, are there other things as well that keep you motivated to get up every day and do all of it again? Yes, it's because I enjoy the fish, number one. I, I got into this ho hobby because I love the fish. Which, you gotta love the fish, which then, otherwise why do this? Yeah, which grew into the business. Um, yeah, if you didn't enjoy the fish, um, I can't imagine being in the business. Um, so that's the, that's the root of it all. Trying to do something that you love and turning turn it into a business where you can make a living to, you know, try and pay the, the bills. At a certain point, at least for me, with my YouTube channel and everything, it's like, I can't imagine doing anything else, you know? This is what I love to do. Yeah. Although, then again, once it becomes a business, there's all the other variables that kind of take away from the hobby side of it. So, um, yeah, there's, there's pros and cons to all of it, but um, ultimately I still enjoy it. I want to take it to the next level and continue to grow it and make it even better. Do you have any upcoming plans that you want to, that you can talk about or? Secrets. Secrets. Oh, well, everybody loves secrets. Yeah, a few of those are not fully developed, so I don't want to really share those yet. But uh, there's good things coming. Ultimately, the, the one big plan is to get the heck out of Michigan because trying to do all of this indoors. It's cold. It's already it snowed today. 30 to, it snowed today for the first time. I should be used to that coming from Minnesota. But I've been in Florida for six months now and I saw snow and yeah, almost got a little giddy like yeah, <laughs> knowing that, was, that I don't have to stay here. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> like making fun of me. Like, ah. So I want to get someplace a little bit warmer so that I can do more of this in a more of a purpose-built space, more like a, a custom greenhouse. Not a hoop house, but a real space that everything can be in and um, keep it going out, outside, whereas, as you saw, I've got several thousand gallons of ponds and things outside, but now that the weather's turning the way it is, it seems like it's been beautiful here the last couple months, but um, all, all of that's coming to a, an end and everybody has to come inside because it's getting too cold. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for bringing me up here and showing me a tour. You've been really, really great. Uh, it's been awesome meeting you. I've talked to you on the phone for, I don't know, how many years, like six years now? I think more like seven, at least Quite seven. a few years now, and so it's cool to put a face to the name and yeah. the voice and uh, see all these fish. I mean, it's been a trip, really, just being able to see the fish kind of the same thing is I've, I've looked at these fish online for years and years, but when you see them in front of you, it's a totally different experience. Thank you so much. Thank You're you welcome. guys for watching and stay tuned for next week. We have another awesome video coming up next week and until then, stay gold!